My head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Have you ever had someone in your life that you felt like no matter what you did, you could not please them? Whatever you did, now don't nudge the person next to you, okay? But have you ever, have you ever had somebody that it, it didn't seem like whatever you did, it wasn't enough? It, it, you, you had to do more, and when you did more of that, you still didn't. I, sometimes, I think as, as I've pastored now for um, about 27 years, one of the things that I see many times is people feel like that about God. That they feel like somehow that they're not making God happy. That somehow that God just looks at them and just, you know, you just don't do enough. You just, and they carry that around and it affects how they relate to God. And they see God as this big distant person that just looks on them and just kind of, well, if I have to accept you, I I will. Um, And that's so far from the truth. It's so far from who God is is in our lives. And um, as we finish up this week on going through the 23rd Psalm, uh, again, I, I look at that and I think it's, it's interesting. Of all the things that David could have uh, said about God, all the titles he could have given them, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. Um, David, being a shepherd himself, understood uh, what it meant to shepherd sheep. He understood that many times it's a thankless task. Many times sheep don't do what they're supposed to do. But David was there for his sheep, and David loved his sheep, and David cared for his sheep. If one of his sheep had a problem, David made sure that that sheep was taken uh, care of. And so in this instance, he says, the Lord is my shepherd, and I'm the sheep. And I know that many times I have more in common with the sheep than I do the shepherd. Uh, And I think we we can all say that at some point in our life. But I want to read through the 23rd Psalm again, and then we're going to focus on the last two verses today. Uh, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As we read through that psalm, verse 3 is really the nucleus. It's the crux of, of the whole psalm when it says that he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. There's, there's a few things there. God does restore our soul. He does something for us that we can't do for ourselves. When I wasn't seeking God, he was seeking after me. And as he restored my soul, he put me on a, a path of, of righteousness and, and it, it, that we refer to as our sanctification as we grow into Christ's likeness uh, that's referred to in Romans 8.29 when he says, for, all, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. God uses everything in our lives, the good things, the bad things, the, the valleys and the mountaintops to conform us to the image of his son. And he, it says in verse 3, he says he does this for his namesake. You know, God is the one who does these works. God is the one who is working in us and through us to help us to be the people that God created us to be. Now, uh, let's go ahead and, and get started in your bulletins. You'll see the first point uh, that we'll see in verse 5. God delights in those who belong to him. God delights in those who belong to him. Uh, you prepare a table before me 
in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. You know, you prepare that table before me in time where this week we're getting ready to uh, celebrate Thanksgiving and we're going to have a lot of feasts. Uh, I know in, in our house it's a, it's a smoked turkey, a, a uh, air fried turkey, and a, and a traditional turkey with the stuffing, the dressing, the sweet potato souffle, the mashed potatoes, and the gravy, and all the pies, and man, I'm, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> we'll go ahead and dismiss now. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we have these celebrations, and, and we look forward to those big feasts because of who's, who, who is around us. It's, it's part of a thing. We just look forward to hanging out together and to being with one another and everything. And when David says, you prepare a table before me, He's referring, many of them would have thought to the many feasts that the Jewish people celebrated. These feasts wouldn't last for hours, they would last for days. And they would eat and drink and just have a great time celebrating who God is and what he has done for them. Um, So David is saying, you prepare this table before me and you do it in the presence of my enemies. You do this, people that don't like me. You make yourself known that I belong to you and you are my God. You are not ashamed of me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. You you let me know that I, you delight in me. You're favored. I'm favored to you. And that's the thing when somebody anoints your head with oil. They're saying something special about you. And that's what David said that the shepherd, the good shepherd does for him. He says, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. You know, it's interesting. God just begins to pour out of his bottomless cup into ours until our little cup begins to overflow. And when we think about the blessings that God has given us, we our cup really is overflowing. Um, now, as I say that, that includes the times that we're walking through the valleys. Uh, as a believer, if you've been a believer long enough, you know it's not if you're going to walk through a valley, it's when. And when you walk through that valley, there's going, there's going to be difficulty. There's going to be... Uh, hard times. There's going to be those seasons in your life where you feel like God has abandoned you. There's going to be those times when you feel you just don't feel God's presence in your life. There's going to be those times when you feel like you're reading scripture and what once used to come alive to you and man you would just you couldn't wait to get into the word. I mean sometimes it feels like you're reading the warning label on a blow dryer. I mean, it, you just you read it and you're just sitting there and you're just kind of reading words and you don't feel that God is with you. We all have those difficult seasons, those valleys, or as Charles Spurgeon talked about it, the dark night of the soul when you're going through these times. Sometimes you can tie it directly to an event, to, to a, a sickness, to a relationship, to a problem at, at your job, to some kind of financial issue. Other times you can't put a finger on what it is. You just know that this is a difficult time in life. But David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I know that you are with me. Now, the great thing about the valley of the shadow of death is these seasons come to an end. And when these seasons end, they give way to feasting. They give way to the times when you can enjoy the, you enjoy the presence of God, you sense the presence of God. That's not just reserved for heaven. It's for, not just for the hereafter. It's for the here as well. When Jesus says, I have come so that you might have life and have it more abundantly, he's talking about right now. Um, the valleys are difficult. And I, I can't overstate this because if you've been through the valley... It's hard for somebody that's never been through a valley to understand it. 
But understand this. The Word of God is no more true because of my experience or lack thereof. The Word of God is like the North Star. It's like a compass. When you pull that compass out, you know it's pointing north. The Word of God is that compass in the life of a believer, that it's always pointing north despite how we feel. There are times of darkness. There are times that you're in the valley. There are times that you don't know which way is left, which way is right, which way is up, which way is down. But the one thing that you know is that the Word of God is true, that He loves you and that He has a plan and a purpose for you. He delights in you. God loves you. God loves you not because of things you've accomplished, because of what you've done, because of a reputation that you have built, because of your status among your peers. God loves you because you're you. You were created in the image and the likeness of God, and you have worth and value because of that. It doesn't matter. Your worth and value isn't dependent upon what somebody else says to you, what they can assign to you. You have value because of who you are. Amen? And you see, we have to remember that. We have to remember that when we're walking through the valley. Because sometimes we feel like we're unworthy. Sometimes we feel like, well, God, God's never going to see me in a positive light. It, you know, it... it it makes me think of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. You know, the, the father has two sons, and one of the sons comes to the father, and he says, I want my inheritance, and I want it now. And the father gives him his inheritance. But can you imagine what is going through the father's mind? You know, I mean, you just said, look, I want everything that I'm entitled to, and I'm leaving. I, I, I don't want to do things your way. I want to do things my way. And the son leaves. And the son squanders everything that he has. In fact, it gets so bad that he has, he runs out of all of his money and runs out of all of his friends that loved his money. And he's feeding pigs to try to earn some kind of, of, of a living. And as he's feeding the pigs, he looks down at what the pigs are eating and he says to himself, man, that looks good. Now, I don't know about you, but the day I look at pig slop and say, dang, that looks good, there's my sign. And you see, with him, he understood when he thought this was good, he was like, oh my gosh, how far have I fallen? And you know, there's something about a spiritual awareness in our lives where we have to be aware of where we are in our walk with God. Sometimes that comes because of we're in the Word and we see it and God convicts us. Sometimes it comes through a message. Sometimes it comes uh, because of somebody that God has put in your life that says, man, hey, where are you going? What's going on in your life? But it's that awareness to know that when we're seeing pig slop is good, that we've fallen a little bit, that we've gotten away from where we need to be, that we've settled in life. God did not call us to settle in life. God has called us to thrive, not just to survive. When the prodigal son came home, he, they saw him in the distance, and, and the father just said, yeah, well, I've got some things to say to him when he gets here. That's not what he says said when the father saw him in the distance, he took off running to the son. He delighted in the son. He loved the son. When he got to the son, he grabbed him and hugged him. The son had his prepared speech that he was going to say. Father, I, 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 did, you, I did wrong. I, I squandered all the money. And I don't deserve to be your son. If you'll just let me come and live among the servants, I, 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 would, I would love to do that if you would allow it. The father didn't even give him time. To do his prepared speech the father grabbed him and hugged him told the people to bring his his robe and the family ring and said we're gonna have a feast because my son who was lost now is found you see sometimes we feel like that lost son don't we 
Sometimes we feel like, that God has to be so disappointed in me. And you see, we have to realize that when our feelings are contrary to God's word, that we need to go with God's word and not our feelings. Amen? There's too many times when you have, a, well, I feel like, we always have to filter our feelings through the Word of God because it is our spiritual compass. God delights in you. Just like the Father delighted in the Son who was lost but now is found, God delights in you. The second thing, we find goodness and mercy in God's presence. We find goodness and mercy in God's presence. I think that if you took all 66 books of the Bible... And you could summarize just one statement of what all this means. What one truth could we take away? If you had to do that, I think you could do it in three words. God with us. God with us. When you look in Genesis at the beginning, the Garden of Eden, God dwelt with Adam and Eve before the fall. When you look at the Exodus... God delivered his people from bondage. He established a tabernacle, and it was right in the middle of Israel's camp, signifying his presence among his people. When the temple was built in Jerusalem, it was built in the center, and God's presence filled the temple. Christmas is coming. We celebrate the incarnation of Jesus Christ, where God becomes man, God with us. God dwelt among his people people. The sending of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, God with us. The return of Jesus Christ one day, God with us. God is with us. When we understand that God's presence is the greatest thing we can seek after, God's presence is the greatest thing we could be given, it changes our perspective in things. David says in verse 6, Psalm 23, verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days in, of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Goodness and mercy following us all the days of our lives. You know, when Jesus, John 10, 10, when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, he says, the thief or other shepherds, they come but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come so that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Over the past several weeks, we talked about who are these false shepherds? Who are these shepherds that really come to steal, kill, and destroy? Uh, those can be other voices, other influences in our life. It can be the world that we live in that's saying, you know what? We've got something better than what the Word says. We've got something better than what the promises of God. Sometimes it can be our own voice. How many of you would be transparent enough to say that, you know what, I've known better, but I didn't do better? <laughs> I've known the right thing to do, but I didn't do the right thing. I, I've been there. In fact, that is the most dangerous voice, I think, that is in our lives. Because I tend to rationalize it when I come up with it. I tend to try to find justification when I've come up with it. But Jesus says... I have come so that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He restores my soul. He leads me in these paths of righteousness as we were talking about the crux of Psalm 23 for his name's sake. When David was referred to in Scripture, when King David was referred to in Scripture, he was referred to as a man after God's own heart. When It all sounds good when you just read over it. But when you think about who David was, when you think about that David was an incredibly flawed person, David was an adulterer. David was a deceiver. David was a murderer. David experienced family dysfunction. One of his own sons formed a coup and tried to overthrow him. His son lost his life. He lost, a, he lost a baby. 
David had all kinds of stuff that went on in his life. Some because of his poor choices, some because of other people's poor choices. But one of the things that the Bible says about King David is that David was a man after God's own heart. Despite his flaws, despite the wrong things that he did, he repented of those and he turned to God. He continued to repent and to turn and to seek God. His desire was to be in God's presence that God would never leave him. In fact, one of the great psalms that I have prayed through and and just meditated on myself is Psalm 27, verses 3 and 4. David writes and he says, Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. David looked out, and he saw an army encamped against him, and he said, Lord, if I can see you, everything will be okay. David looked out and saw an army ready to march on him. And he says, Lord, if I can be in your presence, everything is going to be all right. And you know, I look at David and I I see a man who is incredibly transparent. When you read the Psalms, you see David's anger, you see David's uh, disappointment, you see David's desire for God to do something, you see David's not understanding You see the whole range of emotion in David's life. But you also see the one thing that was true throughout David's life is his desire to be in the presence of God. And when I read this and he says, all this is happening, all this commotion is around me, people desire to hurt me, to harm me, there's an army encamped against me. And I think, David prayed to be in God's presence. What would I have prayed for? And, you know, I I started writing things down. What what would I have prayed for? I would have prayed, God, destroy my enemies. It would have been one of those smite thee prayers. I would have prayed, God, give me a great weapon to deter anybody from wanting to attack me. And I thought, you know, I start making this list, and it was like, God, give me. God, do this. And, And I thought about... Is that representative of my prayer life? God give me, God do, God give me, God do. God give me money, God take away this problem, God give me, God do. God, if you can just, if you can change my circumstances. And I thought, you know what, if God does change my circumstances, I know myself well enough to know that I'll find something wrong with the circumstance that I prayed for God to give me. Coach Kendall was in here just a few moments ago. He's a basketball coach at North Hall. He won, they won their first game uh, yesterday. And, and I said, you know, Coach, you, you win all your games this year. You go undefeated and you win state. I said, how long do you get to enjoy that before somebody looks at you and says, well, Coach, what we got next year? How, how long do we typically, when we get the situation that we've always wanted, how long does it take for us to become discontent with that situation? Isn't it how we're wired? Is that there's really, we're never going to be permanently satisfied with our context, with our situation. We pray for this amount of money, we get that amount of money, and then all of a sudden that amount of money isn't enough anymore. We pray for this house, we get that house, and all of a sudden that house isn't good enough anymore. We pray for this person and we thought, well, dang, I should have prayed for that person. Except me, honey. I'm... I'm... (laughs) But we tend to do that. A change in circumstances never brings satisfaction. It's God's presence that brings the satisfaction. David said, Lord, the one thing that I desire is to be in your presence. The one thing I desire is to be in your presence. And I I, I was thinking... What would it do in my life if I began to pray for God 
for, for me to be able to sense God's presence very strong in my life instead of continuing to pray for Him to change my situation. Have you ever had a problem? Ever, ever had a person in your life that the only time you heard from them is when they wanted something? I, we we all do. We we all have somebody. Don't let you when they want something, you're going to hear from them on a regular hear from them on a regular basis until they get it, and then it's like they forget who you are. And I have been guilty of that in my walk with God. David was a man after God's own heart. And you, Psalm 42, 1 and 2. He says, as a deer pants for flowing streams, or as a deer pants for water, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. What shall I, when shall I come and appear before God? I'm thinking as I, as I read that, am I desperately asking God to move me to a place where I'm closer to Him, where I sense His presence more so than I ever have? As we grow in our walk with Christ, that sense of God's presence should continue to grow and that, that level of intimacy with God should continue to grow. It's like any other relationship that we have in our life. The more time we spend with that person, the more we get to know them and the more we love them for who they are, not what they can do for us. Psalm 67 or 63, 1, he says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. David just desired to be in God's presence above anything. Lord, if I'm in the valley, I just want to know you're with me. Lord, if I'm having to climb the mountain, I just want to know that you're with me. Lord, if I'm on the mountaintop and life is good, I still want to know that you're with me because no matter how much stuff I have, no matter how awesome things are going, if I don't have you with me, then none of it's worth it. This one thing. I asked for. You know, one of the things, and I recently it became a personal thing with me because of a family member, and some of you have had to deal with the same, same thing. When somebody's getting sick and the, the, the possibility of them having to go in the hospital, the fear of being alone and no one being able to be in there with them is overwhelming to feel like you're alone. No matter where you are, I, I can't, I, you know, you hear people make these promises, know that I will always be there for you. I can't promise that to my wife and kids. As much as I would desperately want to, I can't promise them that I'm always going to be there with, for them. But you know who can be? God. I remember years ago, I was, uh, in fact, I was, had been hanging out with one of my friends, went to see them at school. And um, on the way back, I'm driving my new Camaro. And uh, I'm 18, just living large, having a big time. And I fell asleep on the way home and I wrecked my car right on Sardis Road, wasn't three miles from the house. And I remember getting out of my car and I'm, I'm looking at my car. I went through a whole uh, split rail fence 
and hit, it went into the gully and hit the driveway and I'm, my car's in the middle of the road and I, I'm just, I'm awake now. <laughs> And I'm, I'm just looking at the car, and then the police come, and you know, I'm an 18-year-old, and the police, I, I, and all this stuff's going on, and I am, I'm scared to death. And a friend of mine lived right there where I had the wreck, and he had come out, and he called my dad. And um, I remember how scared I was and how, oh my, until my dad pulled up. When I saw him pull up, I calmed way down. He hadn't done anything yet, but the fact that he was there, I understood that, okay, Chris, he's got this from here. He's got it under control. I just remember how seeing him pull up. I knew he wasn't going to be happy that I wrecked the car, but I knew he loved me more than the car. He came to me and said, are you okay? Yep. All right, let me talk to this guy. Sometimes our fears, when we're living life, we got to know that the first thing that God's looking at us and saying is, are you okay? I've got it. There are many folks in our congregation that are going through a lot of stuff. Health issues, job losses, which lead to financial issues or cutbacks and financial issues and bad diagnosis, fractured relationships, the, the emotional impact of the quarantine and everything that is going on. And you might say, Chris, I'm in the deepest valley I've ever been in right now. And even though you're walking through that valley, He is with you. And that's a promise that I can give you, that He won't leave your side, that He's going to be there with you, and He's not, never going to walk away. He's going to walk with you through that valley. He's going to lead you out of that valley. Pray for healing. Pray for God to get you out of the valley that you're in. But more so than anything, pray for God's presence in your life. Because He's there whether you feel it or not. We all go through that dark night of the soul as Charles Spurgeon referred to it. Charles Spurgeon, he would become so despondent, he would have people take scripture verses up on the ceiling when he was laying in bed so that he could meditate on those verses. The valleys are true in everybody's lives, but so are the mountaintops, and so is God's presence in both. In a few weeks, we're going to be celebrating Christmas, and we're going to be celebrating the Incarnation. We're going to be celebrating what in Matthew it says, "...and his name shall be called Emmanuel." God with us. As your pastor, I can say this. I don't know what you're going through. I may have been through something similar or I may not have. But there is a truth that is true that God is with you right now. God delights in you and God desires to know you and to walk with you through the celebrations in life, through the feasting in life, and through the struggles of life. But know that He loves you, and He's never going to abandon you or forsake you. Pray with me this morning. Father God, there are Seems like the older I get, the more I realize that there aren't a whole lot of things that I can count on. But the one thing I know that I can always count on is you. And Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you for that for me, for my family, and for every person here. God, that you are that one constant in our lives. 
And Lord, I pray that you're that one thing, God, that we will seek after. And Lord, I pray for each person here right now. You know each circumstance. You know what season of life that we're all in. And God, sometimes we might just need need a just a, a hug from you to let us know that you're with us. I pray for that. And Lord, sometimes we just need that pat on the back that says, proud of you. And Lord, I know from you we get both. And Lord, I just pray that for every person here. Lord, that as they walk with you, that you will be their shepherd. And they will know that. They will sense your presence and they will rest in that presence. God, we thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for worshiping with us this morning at Corinth. If you are a guest of ours, Chris and Trina will be in the back. Also, if you are a first-time guest, there's a blue Connect card in front of your chair. If you wouldn't mind put, filling that out and putting the offering plate for us in the back, that'll give us a better opportunity to connect with you as a guest here at Corinth. Just a couple of things as we're slowly opening things back up at here at Corinth, our uh, children's ministry. Um, from babies to four-year-old on Sunday mornings are back up with child care. So if you are interested in serving in our kids' ministry, you can talk to Stephanie about that. Um, also, this week, our kids are in middle school and high school students in the back lot. We will not be meeting this week because of Thanksgiving. Um, we're also praying for you as a church this week as you're meeting with family, and some of you may be traveling. What a great opportunity to point your family to Jesus with everything going on in the world right now. So church, we have been the church in here, Corinth. Now let's go be the church out there. Have a great Sunday.